Hello, my name's um, John Halstead. Um, I'm one of the um, historic environment managers embedded within the um, team within HS2. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the different fieldwork strategies we employed for phase one of HS2, the London to Birmingham stretch, um, and give a flavour of some of our preliminary results. Um, so, back in kind of 2016-17, um, we developed the Historic Environment Research and Delivery Strategy. Um, most people seem to be familiar with the term herds now. Certainly anybody that, that's been working on HS2 will be. Um, and the kind of idea behind this at the time was to um, set out research questions in order to um, focus the archaeological objectives for a project that was, you know, essentially huge and unprecedented, sort of over 200 kilometres um, in length. Um, so within that, we um, to develop those questions, we obviously drew on the existing um, regional research frameworks, national research frameworks that were there at the time, um, and held a series of consultation meetings with um, the academic community, professional archaeologists, curators, and others, community archaeologists as well. Um, so we developed a range of about 50 questions um, across all periods that we sort of felt were a priority and that we, we'd like to kind of focus our works on um, during the course of the programme. Um, and those objectives have been taken through in all our fieldwork methodologies, all our individual methodologies for um, the various different site works um, that we've done. Um, so obviously, you know, we started off with a series of questions. We had the environmental impact assessment and the environmental statement that were done in kind of 2014, I think. Um, you know, so we obviously knew a lot. There were thousands of assets um, listed within the environmental um, impact assessment gazetteers. Um, but obviously, you know, we had obviously, you know, as with any other archaeology, archaeology project, we had to go out and try and define and target um, locations of potential. Obviously, some types of archaeology are more visible than others. Um, you know, we have known archaeology, we have the known knowns, the known unknowns, um, and, and everything else. Um, so we had to um, employ um, a variety of approaches. So obviously, um, we undertook non-intrusive surveys. Um, we undertook geophysical survey pretty much over the whole route where possible. Um, so, you know, over 90% of the route will have been surveyed where it wasn't. That would have been because it wasn't physically accessible or suitable. Um, we had LIDAR right at the very start of the project at the um, environmental impact stage, which was flown um, for the HST project, not specifically for archaeology, but obviously um, it was um, hugely useful for the uh, archaeology program. Um, we also started off the project with uh, multi-spectral data across the route too, um, which proved to be probably slightly less useful um, at, at those early stages and going forward. Um, we did employ um, some further multi-spectral work at individual sites um, further down the line. Um, so obviously, um, trial trench and geophysical survey, um, you know, identifies archaeology more readily for certain periods um, over others. Um, so we were kind of quite, quite conscious with some of the um, objectives we had for earlier prehistory, for argument's sake, um, that we also needed to look at the topsoil and look at the plough zone um, for you know, prehistoric lithics, you know, which would routinely be removed in most works um, at the trial trench stage or the mitigation stage when the plough soil is removed. Um, so we integrated that into our evaluation trenching program, not, not everywhere, but at certain locations where we thought there was potential. Um, for instance, um, either side of the Colm Valley, where we had object one of our objectives to, was to kind of consider the Colm Valley whether um, it was a genuine focus of prehistoric activity. Obviously, there's a lot of prehistory, Mesolithic, Neolithic, Neolithic archaeology within the Colm Valley. 
Um, but obviously to look at whether that's a genuine focus, you need to examine areas around it. So um, quite early on, we um, integrated um, this top soil sampling approach um, where we did um, basically three test pits per trench and sieved the contents of the test pit, effectively the equivalent of a kind of half a meter square test pit. But in practice, that was often taken with the digger bucket. What we did, what we sieved the contents um, of those to try and you know evaluate that that resource. It doesn't often get looked at in commercial um, archaeology projects. So that was developed further um, in the central section of the route by our colleagues at Fusion, um, who came up with a blank area testing approach. Um, blank areas were, were a big kind of debate earlier in, early in the um, project. Obviously, none of us actually consider these, are, these areas are necessarily blank as such. It's just that they were areas um, that didn't show archaeology from the regular um, techniques. Um, so this approach was applied kind of interspersed um, between our kind of more regular um, areas of mitigation. Um, it was um, applied in areas where geophysical survey generally worked really well, but where there were no anomalies, um, you know, showing in, in these, you can see examples of blue areas there. So um, a blank area approach is used. It's further, um, further developed um, um, with a predictive model. So um, a predictive model was created to try and um, you know, understand the uh, likelihood of past settlement locations and the various um, environmental factors um, um, that went into that model and helped to define the areas where we um, undertook this work. Um, so what the work comprised was basically test pit programs again um, to look at the topsoil, um, look at the, to look for those periods that are less readily visible in other in other forms of um, prospection. Um, we also trialled some new techniques, some sort of um, quite innovative uh, techniques of um, landscape applied geochemical survey and magnetic susceptibility um, were applied in certain locations um, in Northamptonshire. Um, effectively we you know we an innovative um, proposal was put to us so we so we went along with that um, to see if that actually um, could hone down any um, archaeology in these um, apparently blank locations. Um, and all that work um, resulted in follow-up investigations, um, whether that was um, uh, further field walking um, and ultimately excavations. Okay, so I'm gonna have to speed through this now. Focus desk-based assessment. We did some scheme-wide desk-based assessments, um, looking at paleo-environmental archeology span and geo-archeology. span um, assessing the known resource and uh, helping us to define areas of further work. Um, that was developed further into smaller scale project plans um, to help um, to target um, geoarchaeological test pit work, paleo environmental um, borehole sample, um, sample works, and, and to create deposit models as part of stage processes. For the actual site sampling strategies themselves, um, we actually um, we developed a kind of um, intervention strategy approach where after the initial WSI was agreed, field work started and the site was stripped, we actually had hold point meetings where we discussed the actual detailed on-site strategy, including things like um, the paleo-environmental sampling strategies and where they might need to be revised and the kind of general um, detail. Um, some other bespoke site approaches where we did multiple stages of geophysical survey to try and determine the archaeology better. This is the example of Coles Hill Hall where we had some really exceptionally well-preserved gardens and where GPR um, helped. So just to go th quickly through some of our results. Um, so to give you a flavour of how successful our strategy has been, um, 
for the earlier periods. Um, we have identified Paleolithic and Mesolithic archaeology, um, some quite remarkable um, microfauna and amphibian remains identified in Pleistocene sands in Buckinghamshire. Um, the blank area approach actually produced some really interesting upper Paleolithic um, and early Mesolithic flint scatters and possible settlement um, features and sites in Northamptonshire around the Great Ouse Valley. Neolithic and early Bronze Age, um, a bit more thin on the ground as a kind of consistent sort of flint work um, scatter either from our test pit sites or residually on other excavations. Very few monuments apart from this is one of the more spectacular ones at Wellick Farm which is possibly late Neolithic, early Bronze Age, although we, you've yet to do the, uh, the carbon dates on that. Um, there's a real explosion of archaeology, perhaps unsurprisingly to some, some of you in the room, it, from the Middle Iron Age onwards and the Late Iron Age in particular, we get, um, we've got a lot of um, uh, nucleated Iron Age um, sites, which is going to really help with that kind of broader scale comparative analysis um, when we move into post-excavation and really help um, understand that kind of um, the uh, the economy and society and again with the Roman period lots and lots of sites this will really help to contribute to the rural Roman settlement um, project data and help to complement that and assess that across a, a large tract of the landscape which has been previously um, under investigated I guess um, we do seem to have some patterns emerging where there's a reduction in sites from um, pretty much Birmingham area northwards um, but there's significant potential for comparative analysis, particularly if we use, um, look at the uh, volumetric analysis of the um, um, excavated um, volumes of soil and, um, you know, the consumption of material culture. Early medieval, unsurprisingly, there's actually very little. We have found some settlement evidence and we found some very significant burial sites, one in particular in Buckinghamshire. Medieval, lots of ridge and furrow. Um, as far as I'm aware, the dating evidence isn't particularly great, but we have sampled it. Um, that obviously complements the LIDAR um, data we have for that. Um, I think most of our sites, it's fair to say, were as they were known, you know, as we, you know, known originally. But obviously this is Coles Hill again. Some of the sites were far more exceptionally well preserved than we could have ever imagined. It's a gatehouse that we didn't know existed at the outset. Post-medieval highlights of, uh, has to be the railway heritage at Curzon Street, um, which obviously, you know, good historic map evidence, but um, I don't think anyone had any idea how well preserved that would actually be and how useful that will be to, the, to understanding the kind of function of that site. There were two phases of railway on at that location. And then our cemetery sites, which have grabbed all the headlines, Obviously, major potential for human remains analysis. Um, we've al already pro been providing access to um, academic um, research projects looking at um, um, effects of tobacco on human health and um, inputting into the uh, Francis Crick Institute's DNA, ancient DNA program. And we've had some really good, very successful community engagement programs um, from these sites, particularly. Um, Park Street and St Mary's and St James's as well. So in conclusion, um, I think the lesson learned really is if, we, if we're going to enter into projects with specific research objectives, we really need to consider, um, you know, what methods can best help address each one of those objectives and to take the research objective first rather than, you know, go out there with a kind of standard approach and see what we find. So I think that, that is the, the key message, really. Um, obviously, you need to consider sampling strategies at, at broad landscape scales as well as site scales. And um, all our objectives will carry through into our uh, post-excavation analysis programme. Okay, thank you.